Good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, Atlantic Council front page event. I'm Fred Kemp, I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Uh, Atlantic Council front page is our premier platform for global leaders. Uh, to fulfill that mission, we are delighted to welcome United States Congressman and Chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, the Honorable Mike Turner of Ohio, uh, to discuss the geopolitical situation that will face the next U.S. President. This event, held in partnership with RBC Capital Markets, is the final event of the Atlantic Council's bipartisan election year series titled Elections 2024, America's Role in the World. In the lead up to uh, next week's uh, presidential and congressional elections, uh, this series has worked to promote high level, substantive conversations on the impact that this election will have on US foreign policy. Fred, thank you so much. Um, I understand that um, <clears throat> we're gonna pause for a minute with your comments. I uh, greatly appreciate you having me, and I want to thank you so much for the Atlantic Council and all of the work uh, that you do uh, to contribute to the dialogue of what's important, uh, both for international security and for the transatlantic uh, relationship. Uh, the, the individuals that you bring together uh, help formulate policy for the future. You're absolutely right that we have so much to talk about with respect to um, what's going to be handed to the next administration. And really, I think it's, it comes apart. Um, it, it comes in part from what we've seen in a sort of a failure of leadership from this administration. So many times, as people have talked about the policies that have come out of this administration, the Biden administration, it's been so how they've sort of uh, the Biden administration has sort of been sleepwalking through a number of of uh, a policy international crises where um, the um, the president has really uh, kicked things to the uh, cabinet where the cabinet has almost dissolved into acting like they're, they're NATO, where they come together and try to um, conclude issues by almost uh, coming to a consensus. If they can't come to a consensus, then, then there's no direction uh, that is resolved and no action is taken. They try to manage the issues as opposed to really resolve or conclude them. That means that the next administration has a number of issues that are going to be handed to them that are unresolved. Uh, Ukraine certainly being one, the administration has been more interested in the restrictions that they've been placing on Ukraine not to be provocative, not to, um, as they have said, to um, escalate the conflict rather than to resolve the conflict. Similarly, as we just saw with the conflict of direct attacks from Iran on Israel, they've been more concerned uh, rather than uh, ending the conflict of, as they've said, making certain that it doesn't escalate, although Iran attacking Israel directly is an escalation. Uh, you see it also with the Houthis, uh, where the administration says they don't want escalation, although the Houthis have been attacking directly with uh, commercial um, traffic, you know, right there, um, and uh, have made it very difficult uh, for um, the United States without going in and really taking military action uh, to to address that. And of course, you know, they're uh, the administration even ignoring uh, Russians' efforts uh, to uh, put a nuclear weapon into space as an anti-satellite um, weapon which would be incredibly provocative in, in violations of the nuclear uh, weapons treaty uh, and the administration seemingly uh, acting as if um, that, that that would be tolerable, uh, even not even dis discussing what the United States position would be. And then with uh, Russia inviting North Korean troops into uh, Russia, perhaps even taking them uh, to the uh, battle in Ukraine, the administration not even acting as if this is a red line of North Korean troops entering into battle in um, in Europe. All of these things are going to have to take real leadership from the administration that's coming in next. And that's going to have to be the shift is that the the our adversaries and our allies are going to have to be uh, faced with an administration, regardless of who it is, that's going to have to take a step of leadership. Our allies are going to have to be rallied and our adversaries are going to be faced with an administration that's going to have to step up the plate to change the direction of these conflicts as our allies uh, need rallied and our adversaries, which are beginning to, to uh, coordinate with one another, are going to have to see the United States uh, that is going to step up and say we're going to not only de-escalate uh, but uh, resolve these conflicts in favor of the United States and, and our, our allies. Uh, with that, uh, Fred, hopefully you've rejoined us. Uh, thank you, Chairman Turner. Um, I, I, I guess we had some uh, video problems, but I'm glad to be back, and I think I heard a lot of what you had to say. Forgive me if uh, some of my questions may go a little deeper on something what you've already said. Uh, I'm not sure if people uh, already had the directions, but 
uh, before I turn to you for my questions, we're on the record uh, and you can submit your questions along with your name and affiliation to askac.org. And please give your name and affiliation. And thank you for joining us. And I'll turn to your uh, questions throughout the event. Um, so uh, something happened that doesn't happen very often uh, a few days ago where you had the head of the CIA, Bill Burns, uh, and the head of, um, uh, of uh, the UK Secret Service, Richard Moore, talking about how we're at the most dangerous point for the international order that we created together with our friends and allies uh, at the end of World War II that's brought the world so much peace and prosperity. Uh, so from your perspective, uh, Chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and you see things that are both classified and unclassified, uh, can you provide a high level view of how you prioritize the threats uh, uh, facing the United States? You know, war in, in Europe, war in the Middle East, tensions around Asia, uh, a competition for the commanding heights of, of technology. It's a lot. And the context is going to be the same, irrespective of whether President Trump is elected or whether Vice President Harris is elected. So give us a feeling of how you would brief this context to the next president of the United States as the chair of your committee. Right. Well, you know, China obviously is the most significant threat, but the most immediate threat really is the one that's emerging with this sort of axis of evil, as it's been called, of you know, North Korea and Iran and, and Russia that is beginning to coordinate in a way uh, that is very, very threatening, uh, both to the United States and, and to our allies. And, and unfortunately, in, in, in uh, what we're going to have to accomplish in the next administration is we have not been coordinating uh, with our allies. Uh, you see uh, Israel responding to Iran and Iran's direct attacks against Israel. Uh, you don't see Israel targeting within Iran uh, the production facilities in Iran that are actually supplying Russia, for example, uh, that are ending up on the battlefields of Ukraine. But you do see uh, Iran Russia, North Korea coordinating. You see now even reports of Russia and the Houthis, which of course are a Iranian satellite coordinating. You see all of these uh, adversaries of ours and uh, to uh, the West coordinating and working in a way um, that, it, that is very destabilizing and in a way where, of course, there are authoritarian regimes that are joining together. Now, if you layer on top of that China, you have to understand that you know when when President Xi went and stood next to uh, Vladimir Putin as the Ukraine war began to unfold, and in what we consider to be a, a hot mic, an open mic uh, moment, uh, President Xi was caught standing next to Putin and he said, we, you know, the two of them are bringing about change that hasn't happened within a hundred years. Well, we know what that hundred years is. That hundred years is World War I and World War II. That's the fight between authoritarianism and democracy. And that's what all of these, these you know, access of evil have in common is their authoritarian regimes. They're fighting against um, you know, our allies' democracies. Uh, and they're doing so for grabs of territory and to destabilize uh, democracies around them using proxies or direct attacks. Um, and that is a direct threat and a direct threat to the United States. And that's what the United States is going to be facing into the next administration, is understanding that that is a direct threat to the United States, a direct threat to the West. These are not small territorial skirmishes. Uh, they are not regional conflicts. This is a much broader conflict. And we have Vladimir Putin and um, uh, President Xi standing together acknowledging so. Uh, thank, thank, thank you for that context. Um, uh, George Will, uh, writing we recently in the Washington Post, compared this election to 1940, uh, where uh, you know uh, Germany was at war, Japan was at war, we were not yet at war. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, uh, however, did become a wartime president. Uh, do you think there's a danger that uh, the 47th president of the United States either already is a wartime president in some respects? or could become so when you look at this axis of aggressors. I mean, if I go back to the 1930s, um, if you look at Hitler, Mussolini, and uh, and the Japanese, uh, they weren't really cooperating as closely in defense industrial terms right now as I think 
uh, China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are. Well, you just made a very, very good uh, and, and important point there, and that is the industrial base. And that is one of the things that we're going to have to, to turn to, regardless of, of leadership, regardless of, of how we uh, assert or use our leadership. Uh, if you take, you know, all, we have to go back all the way to the, the George Bush era, uh, where we had actually a focus on our industrial base and working with our allies on uh, the ways in which we produced and that we looked at modernization of our capabilities. And then as we rolled into the Obama era, and you'll recall the era of sequestration, uh, where um, the, uh, the defense budget was cannibalized, if you will, and there were significant cuts overall uh, in defense spending. And during that Obama era, those that cannibalization, those cuts occurred to our modernization efforts. And there was a promise, if you will, that those modernization efforts would be would be made in the future, that they would be brought forward. Well, they they were not. They didn't happen in the Trump era. They did not happen in the Biden era. And so, but as our adversaries looked forward, they did. Uh, China has been modernizing its nuclear weapons, and tripling its overall nuclear weapons capabilities, its its navy, uh, certainly its satellite satellite its anti satellite weapon systems. Um, Russia has been advancing, not only modernizing, but advancing its nuclear weapon systems, um, its, its satellite systems, its technology systems. Certainly North Korea and Iran have similarly been modernizing and expanding tremendously uh, their industrial weapons base, which we're seeing show up on the battlefields of Ukraine. Tomorrow, if we were in a conflict, the ability for us to turn on our systems to be able to produce the weapon systems just to defend ourselves is very difficult as the West is seeing in just the effort to supply uh, the, the, uh, the conflict in Ukraine it is very difficult. So regardless of policy, regardless of, of scope of conflict, uh, the, the next administration is going to have to turn to uh, the now over, well over beyond a decade of, uh, of deferred maintenance and modernization that needs to happen uh, to the United States uh, military systems uh, so that we can have parity with our great power um, uh, competitors uh, so that we don't have a major conflict uh, with, uh, with Russia and China. And then turn to, as you indicated, the industrial base uh, that is not up to uh, being a deterrence uh, to produce what we need uh, to be able to respond. Thank, thank you for that. Um, let me drill down on that a little bit. Uh, talking about an op-ed uh, published last month uh, by you in the New York Times, talking about the People's Republic of China as the most pressing threat, which you've also said in this conversation, but the most pressing threat when it comes to a nuclear strike on the United States or its allies. Uh, the congressionally, congressionally mandated uh, Strategic Posture Commission found that the U.S. nuclear the modernization program of record was necessary but not sufficient to address simultaneous nuclear challenges from China, Russia, and North Korea, all of which are there, potentially over time, Iran perhaps as well. Can you explain to the audience in specifically uh, what your thoughts are on the nuclear forces? And, and do you foresee that the United States needs to expand its nuclear arsenal? You seem to suggest that in the last answer. And especially after the New START arms control agreement with Russia expires uh, in early 2026. Sure, well, I, I use this analogy frequently. So I've, I've got a, 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 um, a 1964 Cadillac and I park it in the garage and it's an antique and I, I love to drive it around. It, it's, it's, it's great to enjoy. Um, and I could say I have a car, but, but in fact, I have an antique. And if you think of that as a nuclear weapon, um, if you buy a nuclear weapon and you park it in a silo, you're going to have to go buy another nuclear weapon, or you don't have something that's a reliable deterrent. You're not going to take a 1964 car and make it your reliable car uh, to, to use for your commute. And, and that's what we've done. We've bought nuclear weapons, and we put them in a silo, and we said, check, we have one. Well, our, our adversaries have continued to build new and more and modern nuclear weapons while we've kept our old ones in a silo and said, check, we, we have one. Well, well, we don't. We have to build new ones just like we would go and buy a, a new automobile. The problem is that in addition to then our, our adversaries building new ones, every time they go and build a new one, as you know, when you get in, in my 1964 car, you don't have that display. You don't have all the features that a new car does. Their nuclear weapons have 
more modern features and they're more reliable. When you turn that key, it's going to you know, do things that the other ones don't. And that's what Russia's doing and that's what China's doing. And so when they look back at what the United States is doing, they don't look at us as having the same level of deterrence that they do. And we are the only uh, nuclear power that, that isn't capable of rolling off of the, the production line, that new nuclear weapon that can go down in that silo uh, while they're still doing this, the same. And it's not that anybody's saying, you know, hey, great, we need more, more nuclear weapons. It's just that if you're gonna be a nuclear power, if you're gonna have deterrence, if you're gonna be able to say, China and Russia, we are the beacon of democracy and you're you know, the, the stalwart of authoritarianism, or we're gonna stand there and be the deterrence that we have to invest and we have to make certain that you're not going to have uh, better than, than we have. Right now, Russia is continuing to advance its nuclear weapons, ones that uh, go into space that are, include hypersonics, orbit the earth and then come down to their targets, some that are uh, unmanned, uh, like the uh, subs that go underwater and then come up uh, against um, uh, cities. China has hypersonic nuclear weapons. We do not even have hypersonic weapons, not hypersonic nuclear weapons, but not even hypersonic weapons, all of which that they're uh, developing. And again, the issue is, how do we deter them? How do we make certain that when they go to to their military offices, that they look at the United States as a viable deterrent to their regimes uh, and their at their desire to advance. The um, it, uh, you know Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia, now Ambassador uh, here, uh, talks it, talks about this as the uh, Xi Jinping shaving mirror test. That when he wakes up in the morning, he just has to say no, not today. We're, we're yeah. not going to take a risk, whether it's with Taiwan or whether it's nuclear, because you mentioned. Um, the uh, Russia space plans. I'd, I'd like to uh, touch on something uh, that you've said earlier that became a little bit controversial. You pressured the Biden administration into revealing Russia's plans for a nuclear armed on orbit anti satellite weapon. And you called the threat uh, Cuban missile uh, crisis in space. And should he win, he could, uh, you know, should he win, how, how could a Trump presidency ensure? The world is free to continue to operate in space. So how do you how do you address this? And should the United States harden some or all of its satellites in low Earth orbit against the effects of nuclear detonation? I, I talk to people in uh, in the intelligence world, and they tell me that what keeps them up at light night is the issue of space. Right. Uh, you know, and this is really one of the, of the failure of leaderships of this administration is that they they got intelligence that indicated that Russia was developing an anti satellite nuclear weapon. And then they sat on it. Imagine if John F. Kennedy had sat on the information that uh, Russia was planning on putting nuclear weapons in in Cuba, and and did nothing and waited till Cuba put uh, Russia put nuclear weapons in Cuba. I I would I would go as far to say is that that um, Europe might not be free today because the United States would be more reticent to challenge. Um, Russia, knowing that nuclear weapons were so close to the United States. But in this instance, this is about checkmate. This is about Russia putting nuclear weapons in space and being able to save the United States checkmate. If um, So the Department of Defense, in testimony before uh, the House Armed Service Committee, indicated that if the uh, Russian anti-satellite nuclear weapon is put into space and then detonated, that a low Earth orbit um, all satellites in low Earth orbit would be decimated and that low Earth orbit would be not habitable by, by satellites for up to a year. Uh, it could be longer. Um, that means that, um, that uh, all of our uh, reliance on space, whether it be you know, economical, our financial institutions, our communication systems, our military, all would, would, be, would be wiped out. Uh, what's also extraordinary about this is that um, you know, the commander for Space Force has said, actually, if that satellite is put into space, from the moment that it's there, it's day zero. Because day, that very next day that that satellite is in space, we have to assume the next day that we don't have access to space. So we'll immediately have to spend trillions of dollars we don't have and impl uh, implement technology that we don't have to be able to find alternatives for use of space. Because you can't just harden satellites that are already up there. You can't go get them. And we don't have technology that can sufficiently harden satellites and put them up there that can sustain 
uh, the kinetic impact or even the radiation of, of currently of a, of a nuclear uh, explosion in space. So we, it would be irresponsible for us to continue to be space dependent um, that, that day that it is up there. So he says, day zero, the very next day, we will have to configure ourselves differently. So this is a complete failure by this administration. They're continuing to do nothing. This should have been something where they're galvanizing the entire world. Uh, this impacts China, this impacts everyone. The moment that Russia does this and checkmates the entire world by, by putting a, a nuclear satellite against, by the way, the current um, uh, treaty regime of which they're signatories. Uh, so th thank you for that answer. Um, uh, colleague of mine, friend of mine, David Ignatius, has just put out a new novel called Phantom Orbit, which is very much touches on issues of this sort. Uh, and it, it sounds futuristic when you read it, but when I listen to your answer, it sounds like it's real time. Uh, so uh, speaking of things that one needs to respond to, but have, what is the response? Uh, we now know that uh, at least 3,000, probably as many as 10,000 North Korean soldiers are training on Russian soil. The NATO Secretary General Mark Rutte, the new one, said that they were, in, some of them in the Kursk region, some of them are special operations, so some of their best soldiers. Uh, uh, you, you argued um, that direct military action should be on the table if those troops are used against Ukraine. Can you make clear to me what you mean by direct military action and how can U.S. policymakers, how can a newly elected president make clear to Russia that this kind of military support constitutes a clear escalation and then deter. Right now, we don't seem to be deterring these sorts of decisions by their leadership. Right, well, this administration has been absolutely silent. I mean, they've said nothing. It's almost as if they're just reporters. They're reporting uh, what is happening as opposed to making policy statements about what should happen or what even the United States position is. We don't know what the United States position is because they have not articulated one. The position should be that this is a red line for the United States. And similarly, they should be calling on NATO to declare it a red line. Now, what, what are, are some of the consequences of that red line? Well, the United States wrongly, I believe, but the, the United States currently has a policy that Ukraine is unable to use uh, weapons given to it by NATO uh, countries and by the United States to attack um, valid military targets inside Russia. So for example, if Russia uses a, um, a uh, military system to attack Ukraine from Russian territory into Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine cannot attack that system back uh, with uh, US weapons or NATO systems. Now that's a valid military target. They should be able to answer. Uh, currently the administration considers that provocative. Actually the first attack from Russia should be the provocation. You should be able to defend yourself. But this administration says no, it would be provocative for Ukraine to defend itself against that attack. So they don't allow them to do so. Uh, clearly, I think the administration, though, should say that if that attack comes from North Koreans on Ukrainian soil, uh, that that they should not be able to enjoy the same restriction that the Biden administration has placed on Ukraine. It should not be open season on Ukraine from Russian territory. Russia should not be able to willy nilly invite any nation across the world to come in and set up shop in Russia and and hit targets in Ukraine and not be subject to a response from Ukraine. That's one. Now, secondly, I think the United States and NATO allies should uh, seriously discuss and consider um, that uh, attacking directly uh, North Korean troops that are in Ukraine and that are attacking Ukraine. Um, North Korean troops do not belong in Europe attacking another European nation. And I think it is in NATO's interest and certainly the United States interests as a member of NATO, that uh, that uh, Asian North Korean, uh, you know, communist troops should not be marching in uh, to a European country and, and attacking it. They should not have the current um, uh, restriction that uh, is is placed on the protection of not attacking between NATO and the United States and Russian troops. Uh, that is a, a valid discussion that I think that that should be be had. Uh, I'm not saying that that it should be a decision that is that is finalized that they should say, yes, we're, we're shooting, but I think they should make the, have the discussion that uh, North Korean troops should not be free uh, from, uh, 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 from not being uh, valid military targets from both NATO and the United States.
That's a that's fa fascinating answer on that. Um, so uh, questions are coming in, and a lot of them do revolve around Ukraine. Uh, so let me go to a, a couple of them. And I think a lot of this goes to a feeling that, um, uh, you know, from uh, Republican officials, legislators, and others, uh, you hear some that would argue that, uh, that President Biden should have done much more. I think you're arguing that with the ability to hit within uh, Russia. And, uh, and then you hear from others, including uh, President Trump, the notion that one could bring this to a very quick end, this this uh, Ukraine fight to a big, big, great end or a quick end. Jack Kropansky is really asking, uh, you know, uh, whether President Biden's for long as it takes is resonating with American voters or people worried about an endless or forever war. And then what do you, what you would think is the answer to that? Well, the problem with it, as long as it takes, is it leaves the Ukrainian people um, and the Ukrainian soldiers forever on a front line of a, of a war of attrition. Uh, because if you're not hitting into Russia, their, um, their industrial base of military production, um, they're just going to keep producing weapons and, and bullets that they're going to take to the front line or they're going to shoot from Russia into Ukraine. And the that's that's only going to result in in increased and continuing casualties into Ukraine. You're going to have to have some point at which uh, there there is a diminishing return uh, for Russia. And the um, the only way really for Ukraine to be able to protect itself is to to be willing to allow them to hit uh, the industrial infrastructure that is producing the military capabilities. That is that is causing the casualties and the attacks in in, in Ukraine. Um, this is this is not um, this is not sustainable uh, in the manner in which it is. It, it is in, incredibly cruel, um, and it's um, uh, it, it's certainly not uh, in a sustainable, winnable way that it that it needs to be. When we're looking at that, this is a battle between authoritarianism and and democracy. This is something where we need to to give Ukraine the support that it needs, uh, that it is winnable so that democracy doesn't have to continue to just see this front line continue to move in a diminishing way. And so uh, this is uh, to the second part of his answer, question, which is uh, what prevents us from forcing a more timely and expeditious solution to the crisis in Ukraine? I would ask answer that. I think you've answered that. Is it by giving Ukraine more military capability pushing them more quickly to the negotiating table or some mixture of both? Right, I, I think it's, it, I mean, it, um, it, it has to be in, in giving them the means within which to defend themselves and, and win. They are a very capable fighting force and they want to fight and they want to win. Uh, giving them that opportunity, I think will result in, in, in their achieving that. And, and that, I mean, giving them the ability to fight for their freedom and to be able to sustain freedom is uh, is incredibly important, I think, for all of us. Thank you for that. And then a last question in this area, uh, and this is from uh, Colby uh, Badwar from the uh, from the Insider. Uh, uh, would you encourage the next president, regardless of who it is, to both lift restrictions on Ukraine? I think you said that, and provide its forces with joint air to surface standoff cruise missiles. Well, I think I think all the capabilities need to be reviewed. I mean, I don't think that there's like one magic bullet. Um, I, I do think that as we look to all the systems that they've requested and how they can be uh, supplied, and both in targets and in what Russia is doing, that there are real ways to coordinate. And I think our allies need to be leaned on much more closely so that uh, their systems and their capabilities are are supplied. I think there can be a um, an increased um, a focus on uh, capabilities for Ukraine uh, that can be a, sort of an awakening for Russia, that they can see that they have things at risk. And right now, I don't think they see, uh, I mean, these are acceptable losses to uh, to Vladimir Putin. Uh, he needs to be in a position where he believes that he has something at risk, and that currently is not the situation. Lots of interest in this subject, I guess not surprising, Mr. Chairman, but the Daniel Breslau asks, 
Um, if Republicans control one or both chambers of the House and the White House, do you expect the appetite? What do you ex- what do you expect the appetite will be for further supplemental appropriations for Ukraine? Will support for Ukraine look different than it does now? Well, most of the the um, significant concern about continued support for Ukraine has been support for the for Ukraine under this administration's constraints to Ukraine. People want a plan to win. They want a plan and support that will result in um, a, a a change of direction uh, that uh, where people can can believe that this is going to result in in Russia being pushed out and Ukraine being sustained. Um, a change administration is going to to change this concern. I mean, the the most thing that has dominated all aspects of this administration's policies, and you saw it even in Biden's statements as soon as um, Israel had responded to Iran's last attack, was, well, at least we haven't been provocative. He wants everything to stay the same. Well, they're not staying the same. Our adversaries are not acting the same. They are becoming more provocative. Uh, They are advancing. if we stay the same, we are going to be staying the same in losing. Um, and that's certainly what we don't want to see uh, with Ukraine. If there is a viable support and, and strong support, I think you'll see stronger support in Congress. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, another very interesting question from a, a longtime friend of mine, Leonard Trank. He's the chairman of the American uh, European Community Association. Uh, and we, he was the former CEO of SWIFT living in Brussels. Uh, what recommendations would you offer the next president on addressing the threat from Iran? And I guess I'd broaden that out of how do you think Middle East approach should stay in general? I know you've talked about that some, uh, you know, with what's happened over the last weeks, uh, you know, the uh, the killing of uh, the Hezbollah leader, leader Nasrallah, uh, the death of Sinwar, the head of the Hamas leader. Um, you just had a strike of Israel on Iran. One could argue that this is, uh, or one one even has some belief that the Israelis might see this as a historic opportunity f- to finally turn around um, really decades of Iranian uh, disruption through proxies in the Middle East. So Leonard uh, Trank's uh, question about how you would approach that, but maybe also in the context of uh, what what do you think our general uh, approach to the region ought to be? No, that's a really good point, Fred. You know, on, on the issue of proxies first, um, this is an unbelievable opportunity for Lebanon and Hamas to, to uh, take a critical view of what could they do to free themselves of Hezbollah and Hamas. As, as uh, Israel is taking action against uh, them both and that they're being diminished, you know, Lebanon really was in a situation where they did, they did not have the freedom to, to uh, take other choices with respect to Hezbollah. They're going to find themselves at that point, um, and uh, hopefully they will be able to have different choices. Uh, certainly with the Palestinians and Hamas, that could also be the case. Um, but the other aspect is, as you look to the next administration, um, I can't speak to the Harris administration, but we can look to the Trump administration by looking to the past Trump administration. The past Trump administration policy towards Iran was solely focused extensively on preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. The Biden administration has not acted as if they've had that urgency. The Biden administration has acted like, well, we have unfailable uh, intelligence, which I do not agree, by the way, being the chairman of intelligence, I can say I don't believe it's unfailable. And that um, with this unfailable um, uh, intelligence, uh, we've got plenty of time. And as having plenty of time we don't have the same urgency. And so they've waltzed through this administration without addressing this issue of Iran becoming a nuclear state. Uh, With the Trump administration, with the the, the pressure campaign um, really focused on preventing uh, Iran from getting uh, a nuclear weapon. And now coupling that with Israel's efforts uh, to dismantle uh, the proxies, you really could have a significant impact uh, on Iran and Iran's march to becoming a, a nuclear weapon state. Um, I don't know what the Harris administration would, would look like if they were a continuation of the Biden administration's um, um, feeling like it's not a, a, an emergency or an immediate need. 
we could lose this opportunity. But there really is an opportunity to impact uh, Iran's march to becoming a nuclear weapon state. And so in short, how do you think uh, the, the Trump administration might differ in its approach to the Middle East right now from the Biden administration at the moment? If you couple the maximum pressure campaign with Israel's success on uh, significantly dismantling uh, the proxies, as you were just uh, acknowledging and, and, and noting, uh, you could have a significant impact on Iran. So you, you, you know, they've they've tried to avoid really the impact directly on Iran by the nefarious actions of their proxies. If the if the proxies activity begins to diminish and the focus becomes directly on Iran itself, especially since they've stepped behind the proxies and attacked Israel twice directly. Uh, you really uh, put them directly on, on the table, and that's going to be new for them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we rarely get so many questions. You really excited our viewership, so I'm going to switch to uh, China now. Um, it, all kind of, it all circles around um, the same thing, how a Trump administration would be different toward China uh, and, and what role, and particularly your committee, should play in positioning us. Um, but let me also deal with a couple of other the questions that have come in, uh, one of them talking about whether the next president should make clear he would defend Taiwan from an invasion from the PRC. So in other words, abandoning strategic ambiguity. And then I'll hold off on the economic technological question that will come next. Well, I, I don't think that the new administration either will or, or should do that. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and in general, how would the uh, Trump administration be different uh, toward uh, China uh, in the Indo-Pacific and in in the competition economic, politically, and militarily? Well, and I think you 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 um, you you gave the right transition, and that is, uh, we have got to win again back uh, economically. Uh, the the way that we diminish our vulnerabilities with China is to reestablish uh, economically. Um, our, our security. And with that, um, we, of course, diminish theirs. Also on the side of, of intelligence and our vulnerability for data, adult, our vulnerability to hacking and um, their uh, access uh, to us, all of those um, have to be addressed. And I think certainly uh, the next administration, certainly the Trump administration will do so. Um, there, there has to be consequences. Currently, uh, this administration has done nothing to address any of the incursions that we found by China. Uh, they, um, you know, in following almost just the uh, the precedent set by the Obama administration of stepping forward and saying, you know, we found that China has done this, we found that China has done that, without any consequences to China. If China is is penetrating our systems, China needs to have consequences, and uh, those. Uh, uh, those incursions into our systems need to be stopped, and, and China needs to have consequences for doing so. Um, these are such tough issues. Um, uh, I, I probably should have followed up on your answer on strategic ambiguity, so I will. Uh, why, why would you keep that uh, um, policy, and, and maybe you could flesh out a little bit more what the approach to Taiwan ought to be under, uh, under a Republican president? Well, I think I, I, I'll leave that to a Republican president. I mean, it obviously has a great deal of, of complexities. And I, I think um, the um, there's going to be a lot that the, a new administration is going to have to, to deal with. Um, and I think this administration, luckily, has a record and a history on, on this issue. So it's not like the Harris administration, where not only are we going to have to figure out what is the Harris administration going to do, um, She's um, she's not fully embracing the Biden administration's policy as and has been weak on a lot of them. Uh, luckily, the Trump administration not only has a record, but it's one that both our allies and our and our adversaries will be able to look at the administration and say, well, we at least know where they're going to be. And then one more on China, uh, de-risking. Uh, the de-risking from China in key technology sectors, is that the right approach? Is a more fulsome economic decoupling from China necessary? You talked to, to a certain degree on uh, the economic questions with China, but how would you address uh, these decoupling, de-risking issues and, and technology controls? Well, I mean, we're, we're going to be making some of those steps uh, already in, in technology, both in, in chips as we're moving forward in, in uh, reestablishing domestic production. Um, and uh, you know, I think the fact that uh, the Trump administration you know, 
uh, candidate Trump has said on uh, during this turn that he's going to be looking at ways in which we can strengthen our domestic production in a number of ways, including looking at protecting some of those. And I think that's looking at those, how do we find ways to trust our systems? And in part of it is informed by ways in which we've seen that not only has um, China taken advantage of, of our, our uh, vulnerabilities economically, but also in penetrating our systems, in, both in data and intelligence. And, and there is great vulnerabilities there and very, very grave concerns. Um, one, one more on Ukraine, and then I'll ask a final question, and then I think our time will be up. Uh, uh, short question, hard to answer. How would you define what victory is for Ukraine and the West in this war from Timothy uh, Ruane, uh, uh, retired Washington Post? Well, a free and democratic Ukraine. I mean, obviously, Putin has, has defined it as he, he owns it and has it. Um, and he has defined it as a, it's not even a valid country. Um, the um, whether or not it is a, a negotiated settlement and that there is some compromise in, in territory will something that history will have to see. Um, but um, it, it has to we have to make certain that, that Putin does not have victory. But but I will put a caveat on that, that a lot of people have not yet. We need to make certain um, that Crimea uh, does not become militarized. Crimea cannot become the new Kaliningrad uh, or basically through Kaliningrad and Crimea. Um, Putin will be able to have reconstituted the reach of the former Soviet Union through um, the Warsaw Pact countries by merely owning two pieces of, of real estate. Uh, we'll have to ensure that that Crimea does not become its access uh, to be able to have military uh, a military threat uh, to uh, Eastern Europe. And that assumes Ukraine would not get back, uh, so uh, dem uh, get back Crimea. So right. democratic uh, and if free... there is if there is a concession and they keep yeah. Crimea, it has to be one that is not and, militarized. And do you see an agreement that lands uh, Ukraine in NATO, or is that something you would want in the future, where Ukraine is integrated in both NATO and the European Union, or is that just uh, well, a free far? and democratic Ukraine means that they are free and democratic and able to determine that self determination, right? Which both includes NATO and Ukraine determining that for themselves in the future. Yeah. So, um, final question, and and uh, you you must have been asked this a hundred times, but for somebody in your position uh, chairing an intelligence committee, I just can't help but ask, what keeps you up at night? What what of all I, the I, things, I, what of all yeah. the dangers we're looking at? What of everything you're looking at really concerns you to that degree? Yeah, actually, I sleep pretty well at night. Uh, it's like while I'm awake that, that the to-do list it looks pretty daunting, um, and I think that the issue on the to-do list really is it's not the things that our adversaries are doing, and it's not the things that we don't know. It's the things that we know that we don't do anything about. Uh, that to-do list, the, the undone to-do list, is the one that I think, ones that I that I, troubles me the most. It's the things that we know we should be doing and that we're not. Uh, it's the things that I think are 60% issues for both the American public and Congress that still remain undone. Um, those are the ones that aren't don't always raise to the top and that, you know, they're not going to on social media get a lot of, of, of commentary and discussion, but they are the ones we need to get done. And that's why I want to thank you, because you help make certain we advance that discussion and dialogue and debate on all those issues that aren't the ones necessarily that everybody's going to be waving flags at, but are the ones that are on the do list that are the must do's and that are good for all of us and are good for democracy. And for that, Fred, I want to thank you because you do that every day. Chair, Chair Turner, I, uh, I want to thank you. We've known each other for many, many years. Um, I've followed your career. I didn't get to give you the full long introduction in the beginning because we we got cut off there. But I, uh, your, your work as chairman of NATO Parliamentary Assembly, you're now vice chairman of Defense Security Committee. Uh, you know, over the past two decades, you've worked uh, serving your constituents, U.S. citizens, uh, one of our finest public servants. So it's just been an honor to, and, a, and it's been a fascinating discussion. And thanks to all the great questions from the audience. Thank you, Chairman Turner. Thanks for having me.